Welcome to the WAN Show. I'm hoping that everything is working. I hate it when Burkle is left unsupervised in the warehouse and does and what pushes things around and uh, just you know does whatever it is that he's doing right now. <laughs> I don't e I don't even know what their channel super fun thing is, but it involves an electric bike or something, and uh, I'm not going to worry too much about it. Yes. The WAN show is less than 20 minutes late because I actually came down at 1 o'clock today and started working on making sure that everything was functioning correctly. So that's why we are less late than we otherwise would have been. Yeah, and Colton was like, oh man, the WAN show might be on time today. Linus is working on it at like 1 o'clock. Colton is young and naive. And stupid. No, and just that's that was rude. Stupid. He's not, stupid. He's not stupid. He just hasn't learned yet that the, the WAN show's never on time. You know, that's just the way it is. All right, so we've got a lot of great topics for you guys today. Luke's actually on vacation. He's over in London working on some kind of high technology product launch. I'm fairly certain we signed an NDA, so I'm just not going to say yeah, don't don't talk about that. Anything about it? <laughs> nothing about it other than that he's there, he's doing a thing, and I'm sure if your Google foo is strong, you can figure out what he's doing and what it has to do with. But he's taking a few days off before the event, and in in the meantime, I am stuck back here in Canada, literally unplugging and plugging in USB connections thousands of times. That is what I spent the last hour and a half or so working on. Is it micro B? Yes. So, oh, so that's your own personal hell. That is, yes, <laughs> basically. Well, it's only half hell because the other half is type C. So I teased this on social media a little while ago, but I'm actually going to be doing a head-to-head -head comparison of how many plugs before micro B or type C break. At least it's not non-reversible A, because then before every plug, you'd have to flip it over three times. So we've got a lot of great topics for you guys today. Uh, first up, the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 has been announced, and uh, this one's a shocker. The screen is big. Wow! The NVIDIA Titan XP has been reviewed and benchmarked. Wait, that is, is to say by other publications, not yeah, by us. So it's it's not called the XP, right? It's just the X, right? No, it's called the Titan XP. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so Microsoft pitches technology that can read facial expressions at political rallies. So, uh, you know, we're that much closer to Skynet, I guess. We're that much closer to... do. They, okay, so <laughs> uh, question. Do they aim yeah. them at the politicians? Or at the audience. No, at the audience. Oh, because I was thinking aiming them at the politicians might actually be a lot more useful. It'd be like well, a yeah, lie detector. That would be like an actual, you know, boon to society. Whereas this is just, let's figure out who doesn't agree with dear leader well, and, uh, and we'll get them out of here. Actually, would it be helpful to tell us that politicians are just lying the whole time? I mean, we already know that in theory. I mean, anyway, what else we got? What yeah, else we got? Okay. We'll talk about it in more depth later. Um, the world's first programmable quantum computer is apparently a thing. I haven't Woo! actually read anything about this topic, so uh, we'll see what happens. Yay, Colton! I checked. I think it's the right one. Hey. It works. There's no weirdness in there. Yeah. <laughs> Birthday. I think they should actually change their slogan to that. It should just be like, Squarespace! Bang bang! Linda! Wang Chow! Alright. Alright guys. So why don't we jump right into our first topic here today. The Galaxy S7 has launched our original article here. Did I say Galaxy S7? See, this it, like... is where I run into trouble. This is where, or this is where Samsung gets me into trouble by having multiple devices that are very, very similar. So the original article here is from Anontech. At least I think it is. It's hard to tell with all the soft layer ads on all sides of the uh, on all sides of the website. Dang. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's Anontech. 
Shot, shots, shots fired. Although those, Dang. those who, those who, uh, what is it? Live in glass houses, something, something. Yeah, rocks. don't, don't. Those who live in glass houses sink ships or something. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it goes something along those lines. And especially with our resident ad man, literally sitting next to me. <laughs> I, I thought <laughs> it probably doesn't make sense for us to be to be too critical of ads, but. Uh, <sighs> So, what is there to say? But, oh, so usually the co-host job is to take the link to the original article and post it in the Twitch chat. Wait, you actually expect me to do stuff while I'm sitting here? Yeah, that's what I thought. I didn't was, sign up for that. That's what I thought was going to happen. I thought you were going to say things and do things. I didn't sign up for that. Um, so, basically, it's about as similar to any S-class product that we have pretty much ever seen. So, spec-wise, you're getting a Snapdragon 820 in the US anyway. Uh, for RAM, four gigs of LPDDR4. For storage, you're getting 64 gigs plus micro SD expansion. I mean, having micro SD expansion on the Note series was, I think, a bigger deal when it was not notably absent from the S series, but it yeah. has kind of gone full circle now and is, is back on the, S on the S7. Um, the screen is 5.7 inches. It's 1440p. It's... Uh, S A M L E D or S M L E D, okay. Uh, dual edge display. It's got a 12 megapixel rear camera, 5 megapixel front camera. I mean, I'm just getting bored talking about this. <laughs> a 3500 milliamp hour battery. I think the more interesting aspect of the conversation is that Samsung apparently learned how to count from everyone else in technology. Wait, yeah, we missed the Note 6. Yeah. I just realized that. You didn't realize? No, I actually, I, I, I pay so little attention to the yeah. Note lineup because it's kind of like, okay, let's say you were me. Yeah. And like Trojan. Got them small. Releases hands. a new line of like Magnum condoms. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they've got like the Magnum X and they've got the Magnum XL and they've got the Magnum XP or whatever. Are you really paying attention? The Titan Magnum XP. So for me, the Note series, and I will be reviewing the Note 7 um, at some point, at some point yeah. uh, over the next little bit here. And I'll say my usual thing. I'm going to say it's a big Galaxy S7 and it's too Literally big. Literally now. Because Literally now. They called it the Note 7 to line up with the S7. Um, so. so stay tuned for that or don't bother. It's totally up to you. Uh, but there are some unique things. So the S Pen now allows you to turn videos into GIFs, which if you're a frequent Twitterer is going to be a huge boon for you. So your tweets can now have 70% more GIF and not just the canned ones. When you click the thing, you can make your own. Um, you cannot put the S Pen into the phone backwards anymore, which isn't to say you, <laughs> which isn't to say you couldn't before. The problem wasn't putting it in. <laughs> it was that so you couldn't get it back out. Yes. <laughs> this is cool. It's IP68, so that's uh, dust and water resistant. resistant yeah. um, with the S Pen attached or detached. That's pretty cool. Anytime you open up a large hole in an object, you are significantly um, reducing its ingress protection ability. So that's pretty cool. And this is the big one. Samsung has introduced iris authentication with the Note 7. So I obviously haven't used it. I haven't seen it in action. I will definitely be commenting on that, but I do have an initial important question and mm -hmm. we will debate this. Sure. And I wanna hear from you guys on this. I'm gonna go ahead and create a straw poll right now. Do you feel like iris protection, hold on, I'm just gonna, type as I go. Do you feel like iris protection is A, any more convenient or B, any more secure than fingerprint protection, which we already have? Hmm. Do you want me to give my opinion now or should we wait for the... Hit it! I mean... I feel like there has to be more issues with iris protection, at least at first, right? Because at this point, the sample size from the public on fingerprint is so massive. 
Mm -hmm. So obviously, Iris has to be at a certain level in order for them to even have it on this. But, I mean, I would be a little bit hesitant, at least at first, like first generation of it for the public. Obviously, it's been on other stuff in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of something as <coughs> ubiquitous as a Note series smartphone. My my take on it is that anything anything camera reliant from my experience, you know, going back and Samsung Samsung does this kind of thing to themselves. Um, anything camera reliant on a Samsung phone, and whether you want to talk smart stay, mm -hmm. uh, where the screen stays on if you're looking at it, mm -hmm. or if you want to talk about. Um, what was it? I think they had like uh, like hand gestures that you could do to take pictures with the selfie camera. Samsung's okay. had a Samsung's had a lot of motion and camera controlled features, most of which have been absolute garbage and just plain haven't worked very well. And people are saying it is a sensor on its own, so okay. it uses IR as well, so that's good. See, this is why it's important for me to read Twitch chat instead of just going on and on forever. <laughs> but Anything, okay, so with the exception of the touch sensor, anything Samsung's done that's like, like a, a, a biometric or, or natural human interaction thing has been either kludgy or basically not worked at all from my experience. So I am both excited and also very skeptical to see how well this works because it's all fine and good if it works on you know a brightly lit show floor or if yeah. it works in, at, during the day but is this the kind of thing that's going to work dur at night well, and if it doesn't ir so it should theoretically it should theoretically um or is it going to work when there or is it going to work i mean that's here that's another interesting point of part of the conversation is it going to work where there's a lot of ir pollution yeah, like let's say you're on the CES show floor. Is there going to be too much pollution? I don't know. I don't know. So, and the question that I have that we have to answer then is, if it doesn't work all the time, if it isn't bulletproof, and quite frankly, I'd say the first generation of Touch ID was pretty good, and now it's gotten to the point where phones are coming out, whether it's the Axon 7, uh, whether it's the Galaxy S7, uh, whether it's the iPhone 6S, phones are coming out now where fingerprint detection is so fast and so accurate, like even if your fingers are a little bit damp, that I almost always use it. I use it all the time, I don't have to think about it. Until iris detection gets that good, I don't personally feel like it is going to be more secure or more convenient because as it is, you could make the argument that someone could steal your fingerprints. I mean, they did it on Mythbusters. You could make the argument yeah. someone can steal your fingerprint, they can create um, a rubber mold and that, or a silicone mold, yeah. and then they can, they can spoof it. In fact, I believe it's been faked on, uh, on phones already. So arguably, fingerprint is not the most secure thing. It's much more difficult to extract someone's eyeball. Right. However... There, there have to be other spoofing measures, though, That's right? still pretty difficult. That's still pretty difficult to do, the fingerprint sort of creation thing. I think if someone is that determined, they're probably just going to put a gun to your head and tell you to unlock the phone anyway. So yeah. I don't personally believe it adds a lot of security, and I also don't personally believe it adds any convenience. If anything, I see that being less convenient because I don't know about you, but my phone's already unlocked by the time I get it in front of my face. Yeah, um, a lot of the time. Not this one, because the Axon 7, you can't use the fingerprint sensor as a lock button. Actually, wait, yes, you can. Okay, sorry, I was wrong. It didn't do it a second ago there. You just have to wait a little bit longer when you do that. But it's really fast when you press the lock button initially. Um, but on the S7, where the lock button is on the front and it is like what I reach for first when I pull it out of my pocket, it's unlocked well before it ever reaches my face in the first place. So I don't really see that being uh, a huge factor for me. So Let's go ahead and check out the results. Here's a bit of a tangent, but what... What if they were to use something like an IR sensor to try to inhibit stuff like texting and driving? Where, like, if there's some type of a gyrometer or gyro or whatever in your phone, yeah. that is like, you're moving at a certain speed, you have to use your IR sensor so that you can't just unlock your phone when it's, like, down here by your side. I mean, I... I can't see, I can't see phone manufacturer... Because, okay, so the cold hard truth is that people are going to... They're going to do it 
okay, okay. The cold hard truth is that phone manufacturers aren't going to start interfering with dangerous user practices yeah. that inconvenience the user that wants to do it yeah. unless they're mandated by law. Yeah. So I don't see that happening. I don't see um, it happening either. That was just like, what if? Like, I'm just trying to think of a scenario where this could be potentially positive. Right? Like, I could see that being an app that, like, a parent might install. But I mean, okay, you know, I'm. I'm sure Twitch chat is telling us like stuff like this exists where it knows if you're driving that uh, the phone shouldn't work. Like it's the kind of thing I could see parents installing on their kids' phones. Yeah. So that's something. I could also see it being useful and uh, we've, so we've got, uh, we've got the results from our straw poll here where people are saying for the most part, uh, not more convenient or more secure with about 40% of you saying it's either more convenient or more secure and only 14% of you saying that they think it will be more convenient and more secure. So one way that it could add security would be if Samsung allows us to require both a fingerprint and an iris scan. Yeah. But I'm, again, I haven't had my hands on the phone. I haven't looked into this a lot. Um, so stay tuned. I, I will be covering it. That will come later. We'll see how it goes. All right. The uh, Titan XP reviews and benchmarks have arrived for some hey, outlets. Don't don't hate on my Titan XP <laughs> naming, all right? <laughs> oh, these guys spelled it wrong. They missed they missed uh, the P on it. They missed the P, dude. Ah. Oh. They missed the P. All right. So, so uh, did you copy that into the Twitch chat? <sighs> Thank you. So <laughs> All right. I actually talked about this. Um, PC Per was live streaming on their way down to like QuakeCon or something. I actually forget where they were going, so I'm just naming a random land. Is QuakeCon right now? I don't I know. think so. I have no idea. Anyway, the point is PC Per was on their way down to a LAN event, and they randomly Trout randomly called me. And uh, speaking of using your phone and driving, he had one phone that he was using to talk to me, and he had the speaker of that phone held up against the microphone of another phone that he was periscoping from that he was he was actually he was only streaming audio so he was oh, okay. audio streaming from that one and i didn't know this until the end of the of the talk let's, let's give shroud the benefit of the doubt maybe yeah. he had a hands-free solution going on we don't have yeah. video proof of any of this and maybe someone else was driving maybe someone else was driving maybe, maybe someone, else was driving. someone else was holding the phones maybe pc per makes so much that he has a, a, a dedicated chauffeur okay <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe Shroud's just a baller, all right? Could be. So anyway, I was talking to Shroud about this, and the way that NVIDIA handled the Titan X launch, I was kind of, I pitched this to him, and he kind of went, yeah, I don't know, it sounds plausible enough, but I doubt he knows one way or the other, and if he did, I'm sure it would get someone at NVIDIA in trouble for him knowing. Uh, but I was just like, you know what it seems like happened here? Jensen basically woke up, Poured a bowl of cereal for breakfast or whatever it is that bazillionaires eat. Yeah. Was sitting there eating it and went... <laughs> I'm going to launch the Titan X today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said that to you earlier this week. Yes. <laughs> That's kind of how it looks like to me that this went down. Yeah. Because there, was, there were no materials sent to reviewers. We got... The an email, I think, like 10 minutes before being like, Hey, just FYI, Titan X is going on in 10 minutes. There was, we didn't get an NDA. Nope. We actually, I don't think we ever signed an NDA. Nope. So, so it was uh, 10 minutes before launch. Um, so, so, but, so, but the, well, the announcement, the announcement prior to the launch. So, oh, sorry, so the yeah, announcement. 10 minutes before announcement. So we never had an NDA at any point prior to the launch, and there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that, <clears throat> um, so some people got their Titan XPs the morning of the launch that night at 9 p.m. Pacific time. We didn't get ours until noon about. Or Tuesday? after the day of the yeah. launch. And I'm kind of sitting here going like, oh, honestly, I haven't talked to anyone at NVIDIA about this yet. But when I do, it's not going to be a happy conversation. I'm going to kind of explain a little something. I'm going to say, okay, so look, you gave us nine hours, of which only six of them are working hours because we're running a real company. We're not like a guy in a basement with nothing to do until NVIDIA, you know, decides to bestow upon us a graphics card that we have the privilege of covering. Um, and I mean, to be clear, yes, we do appreciate getting hardware from manufacturers so that we can have timely coverage of it. But the way that that normally works is we get it with enough time to do coverage of it. So in this case, we got six actual working hours of which, let's do the math backwards, okay? Of which I'd say about 15 minutes of it goes into actually like filling out all the fields on YouTube. Yeah. 
Okay, about five minutes of it goes into uploading it. About half an hour to 45 minutes of it is exporting it from Premiere. Assuming we only have to do that once, which sometimes we don't. Like 20 minutes waiting for it to process on YouTube. Yep, 20 minutes waiting for it to process on YouTube. So we've already we've already used up well over an hour of yeah. our of our six hours. Okay, so just saying these these are things that happened. Um, editing it takes about six hours. Okay. Benchmarking it takes another, you know, probably four to six, depending on the depth. Yeah. And for something like Titan XP, we would have liked to do more benchmarks because Nvidia yeah. has come out and said this is not just a gaming card; it's like machine deep learning, learning, deep learning, all that stuff. Yeah. So we've never benchmarked a card for deep learning Ooh. before. It's never come up, so it's the kind of thing where there's a bit of a learning curve. So let's say there's a few hours of actually figuring out how to benchmark the thing in the first place. Yeah. Um, aside from that, there's actually, you know, usually attending a briefing call so that you have some idea what the crap is going on. Not that I think there Did was Did we even one. get like a white paper or anything? No, I don't believe there was a reviewer's guide for it. Um, you know, so usually there's some time spent reviewing the reviewer's guide. Actually, no, maybe he got it the morning of. Or something like that. Anyway, okay. the point is, it was not actually possible oh yeah oh yeah shooting b-roll so th this is another challenge because <coughs> theoretically you could shoot b-roll like on the fly while someone is working on editing in a linear fashion through the video and we've actually done that before yeah the problem is that there is absolutely no way to shoot b-roll of the card while it's being benchmarked well so I mean, you could get b-roll of it on the on the test bench oh, <laughs> oh brandon how long does it take to do b-roll of a graphics card So Brandon figures he could speed through one in four hours. But that probably assumes that Brandon's working on one of those uh, endless streams of identical cards. Do you remember when we did like three Windforce cards in a span of two weeks? I've seen the Windforce card more than I think I've seen anything. Yeah, <laughs> good old Windforce. So basically, NVIDIA gave us a literally impossible goal of having a video up on time for this launch. It was very frustrating. But there's good news. Now that I'm done ranting about how they really should organize themselves a little bit better. I mean, it's funny because between them and AMD, actually, um, I, I don't oh. think... I, I can't talk about that one yet. Or is that one launched? I don't know when the NDA I, is for that. It might have been... I don't know. Like, the last couple weeks of graphics cards deliveries and stuff has been like... Okay, yeah. The RX 470 embargo is lifted. So that was another one where our RX 470 arrived today, our official one. We actually already had one from someone else, yeah. but we didn't have a reviewer's guide and we didn't have a driver yet. So this like, is funny to me. 1080, RX 480. Very organized. Events around them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relatively That's speaking. Fair. Yeah. Like they were talking to us about RX 480 launch a three month weeks, before three weeks or four three weeks, weeks before. before like we were we were organizing stuff um that's three weeks before the event which was a month and a half or something before the launch yes and then 1080 uh to a lesser degree nvidia does the whole like cloak and dagger yeah, yeah, yeah. we are nvidia we are like super secret <laughs> business bro they they do that a little bit more than amd does yeah. um <clears throat> at least intentionally so in the case of both titan x and rx 470 it's just amazing the contrast. It's like, did they spend all the budget or spend all the time organizing these launches and then just kind of go, oh yeah, I guess there's like other stuff too. I like, I or did really, they decide? I really don't understand this launch sequence. Like, it almost feels like, I don't know. It almost feels like RX 480 was announced and then they were like, oh crap. <laughs> like we got to do 1080 very soon then. And then it wasn't RX forty wasn't what they were expecting. So then just this landslide happened because like there was misinformation or something, and someone thought they were going to be competing with someone else at a similar price point, and then they weren't. So then they had to match up, which then caused the other team to keep going forward. If that makes sense, like it just feels very disorganized this time around. All right, so let's talk facts about Titan XP. It features a 16 nanometer GP102 GPU. So this is very close to the Pascal GPU we've been introduced to in the Tesla lineup, but not quite the same thing. It's got 3584 CUDA cores. So when you compare that to the Titan X, the previous 
card. Uh, when you compare that to the Titan X, it had 2560, so this is a very significant uptick in CUDA cores, uh, and that pretty much comes from the process node trick. I think that may have supposed to be... That, that was probably supposed to be GTX 1080, I think. Oh, is that 1080? I believe so. Oops, I can't remember. Anyway, it has 224 texture units, 96 ROPs, a base clock of 1417 megahertz, and a boost clock of 1531, with hardware Canucks actually managing to get it to overclock to a continuous, like, holding steady frequency of 1923 megahertz. Yeah, the old, old Titan X had 3072. 3072, thank you. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> so... It's got 12 gigs of GDDR5X RAM, so we did not see HBM2. Again, this is a downgrade from the Tesla card, and it's clocked at 10 gigahertz quad data rate and a 384-bit memory bus for a total of 480 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth and a 250-watt TDP. So once again, NVIDIA has one of the hottest cards on the market. It's funny, people give AMD a lot of crap for having really hot cards. Yep. The difference is that when it comes to performance, per watt, uh, the Titan X really does come through. So it's about 20% faster than even non-reference 1080s in some titles. And as far as single GPUs go, it is king. I was actually talking to Shroud about this too, but it's gotten to the point where on the like performance charts in their reviews, it's like NVIDIA land and then like AMD. Yeah. Like it, it's gotten to the point where AMD has, like it's, you give it enough, if they keep up the way that they're going, you give it another couple of generations like this, AMD may find themselves a full generation behind NVIDIA, while NVIDIA sells graphics cards at a whopping 1200 US dollars yeah, a pop. That's insane. Lining their pockets, stuffing the coffers, and giving them more money to spend on R&D to cycle faster and faster and faster. This is a troubling time, a very troubling time, because NVIDIA could easily slash the pricing of their lineup and make it very difficult to recommend buying an AMD card, but NVIDIA is not really, not really prone to do that. They tend to wait until AMD puts actual pressure on them to drop the price. So instead, they're sitting there accumulating massive amounts of money to spend on basically, you know, whatever is the next technology they're going to introduce, whether it's GameStream or G-Sync or whatever else that makes it so that at least some gamers are going to look at this card versus that card and go, well, this isn't even a decision because AMD straight up doesn't have feature X, Y, or Z. And I love how like you say things like NVIDIA cards are performing better right now and people in Twitch chat call you an NVIDIA shill. That's just the facts. I don't make the rules, yo. We're not saying like they're better in performance per dollar, although in some cases, I think the, no, 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 the RX 480 was better than 1060 in performance per dollar. I, I can't remember. Um, but it's just the facts. Like. <laughs> Yeah, some people so uh, rage something in Twitch chat says Nvidia won't let AMD go bankrupt. I'm actually not convinced that's anything to do with the motivation at this point. Um, I think it's just a matter of not wanting to sell computer hardware at low margins, um, not wanting to constantly iterate on new silicon as fast as they possibly can, the way that they were doing, you know, back in the mid 2000s. And it's a matter of just being happy to sit and make ample margin and happy to have AMD sit there as a measuring stick for why NVIDIA's graphics cards are worth a lot more. Troubling times. So, yeah. Just the, the $200 price hike is what really gets me. It's just, it's the same as the 6950X. It's like, we're charging this because we can. So I actually thought that there was some justification for the $200 price hike. Yeah. And I went back in time. I may have actually done this on WAN show when the Titan XP was first announced. Mm -hmm. um, so I went back in time and adjusted for inflation. Like yeah. I found super crazy, stupid Halo products from you know, 10, 15 years ago yeah. and compared them. And the $200 price hike was definitely still unjustified. But it's not as unjustified as the seven hundred dollar price hike on the sixty nine fifty X. But I can talk more about that one actually now. I've I've been yeah. working on a pretty interesting video that that 
Okay. That does... Don't spoil anything, but... I, I won't, but that does put that price hike into a more... more perspective. Um, yeah, it puts it into a different perspective for me. Okay. So, anyway, one thing that we're ignoring when we say NVIDIA is jacking the price, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et is that R&D costs are going up. Generation by generation, yeah. R&D processes are going up at the manufacturing level, so at Global Foundries, TSMC, Intel, and at the chip design level. Pascal is a more complicated, more difficult to design product than Maxwell, than Kepler, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, back to Intel's price hike on the 10 core extreme edition. Basically it's a Xeon. So it, where yeah. it comes from is not wanting to cannibalize Xeon. Because when I was working on my what CPU should I buy video, mm -hmm. I actually worked into my comparative sheet. I worked all the, everything from Celerons all the way up to the $7,000 four-way uh, E5 or, or E7 series yeah. Xeon. Or is it E5 4000? Anyway, I forget, I forget the nomenclature is. Either way. Don't worry about it. Anyway. I worked in the whole thing, and what I realized is that aside from the 6800K, which is priced more like a desktop chip, and I think the reason for that is because they kneecapped its PCI Express lanes, making okay. it suitable for desktop use, even two-way SLI, which is all we recommend around here, but not really suitable for server use, where many, many expansion cards is much more likely to be a thing. Mm -hmm. Except for the 6800K, there is basically an equivalent Xeon in the current generation, and you can look back at the previous generation and go, yeah, that was kind of the one that that was a successor to, too. Okay. So they pretty much price them like overclockable Xeons that don't have ECC. And you are paying a slight premium for the Xeon because it has ECC. So it can handle server memory. Okay. And that's it. That's basically, that was the logic. Do I like it? No. <laughs> yeah, the issue is now is that they're labeling it as a Core i7 and they're trying to sell it to consumers, obviously very high-end consumers. At a server price. At a server price. And the other thing that bothers me here, too, is not necessarily what they've done on the Extreme Edition side, because quite frankly, I've never recommended an Extreme Edition to anyone. I've never recommended that someone buy an Extreme Edition. It has not happened. And that was true when they were $1,000, and it's true today now that they're $1,700. So it doesn't matter to me. It didn't make it any more or less likely that I would recommend one. Um, to me, the part that I find more objectionable is that Intel has been in, in, in the range that I actually expect people to buy. So that's on the consumer platform, the consumer chipset and socket. Mm -hmm. They've been selling us quad cores for 10 years. Q6600 turned 10. Or actually, no, not quite. Sorry, sorry, not quite 10. We'll turn 10 within a year. And that's like still a sort of relevant chip. Sort of. It's like somewhat usable. Yeah. So Q6600 was launched at around 700 US dollars. But within, about, again, about a year was down to pretty similar to what you'd pay for a 6700K today. So you could get a kind of not quite enthusiast blah blah extremo edition quad core for basically what you're paying for it today, almost 10 years ago. I think consumers should be getting a six core. I don't see a reason why the enthusiast range goes from six to eight and consumers are still stuck with a quad. I mean, I do see a reason because they've had more emphasis on better onboard graphics, which I could end up completely eating my words. Mm -hmm. You know, five years from now, when those chips with the better onboard graphics are just, you know, blowing through video rendering or, or you know, uh, encryption tasks or whatever the case may be, using that GPU power. <laughs> but for now, putting onboard graphics on a 6700K just makes me kind of feel bad when it could have just had more cores or more cash. Yeah, you got to remember your perspective, though as someone who always puts a dedicated graphics in a machine. Yeah. Like okay. a lot of Fair people, point. a lot of people don't need more than four cores for the little amount of gaming and, you know, voice comm and, and music that they're going to be running, right? That's true. Like, and especially when you factor in hyperthreading. Yeah. I just feel like if they could give us four cores nine years ago, then why can't they give us a couple more today? I'm sure that they could. 
I mean, um, they, and they are higher performance cores. Actually, Anantech did a great article comparing modern CPUs to uh, Conroe. Okay. It's, it's worth having a look at. You guys should check it out. Anyway, but go ahead. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I feel like they're trying to target someone who isn't you with the four core, <laughs> which is probably smart in all honesty. So it's, so, so basically what you're saying is that it's no freaking mystery that I'm salty because I'm not the target market for the reasonably priced one. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. Well, alrighty then. <laughs> oh, um, so speaking <laughs> of, uh, you know, money, Squarespace! Woo! I am going to have to legitimately pull up my Squarespace integration notes because I can't just, you know, talk crap about, you know, oh, oh you know, Nick is gonna, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't care what Nick has to say about my sponsor spots because he actually is close enough to hit me right now. So Squarespace has 24-7 support via live chat. They don't offer telephone support. It costs only $8 a month and you get a free domain if you buy Squarespace for the year. All their templates feature responsive design, so your website scales to look great on any device. They all have a commerce module. Every website comes with a free online store. Uh -huh. Their cover pages feature allows you to set up a beautiful one-page online presence in minutes. Tell me more. Everyone can now publish content in Apple News format directly from their Squarespace blog module. It's available to, oh, that makes it available to millions of potential readers. And you can start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use offer code WAN to get 10% off your first purchase, which is in brackets. You like, your, your salesman voice is the worst. I'm sorry. <laughs> make sure that you use offer code Linus at 1-888-656-SQUARE. <laughs> no, that's not a real number. It's, Square it's has, not. Square has too many letters. <laughs> the fine print. <laughs> well, maybe there's no E on the end. But like, that's actually Square? when I said... <laughs> and are we going to drop the U too? Square. One, one eight six Square. six. Square. Square. Um, when I said tell me more, that's actually that would be a decent slogan for their their Apple News format. Squarespace. Tell me more on your Apple News format. See now he's making up slogans. What is with the double standard here? I get crap for not. You don't make to the up script. slogans. You just use old slogans that they don't use anymore. I only did it because someone told me I should. I hate you. All right, moving on to <laughs> lynda.com. Lynda's used by more than millions. More than millions. More than millions. Ugh, wh why do I even try? <laughs> this is what happens when I spend the hour and a half prior to the show unplugging and plugging something in over and over and over more again. More than millions of plugins. I mean, technically, millions is by definition more, more than, than millions, millions. Or it can be. Because I didn't clarify how many millions. So there, there are multiple millions. So three millions would have been more than two millions. I feel like I've been plugging in a USB for three hours at this point. All right. So Linda is a great way to learn online. They've got more than 3,000 courses available, and they're used by millions of people around the world. They've got topics like web development, photography, visual design, business, um, video editing, cinematography, um, basically pretty much anything it would take to get a fantastic job at Linus Media Group. They've also got software training for programs like Excel, um, as well as um, <clears throat> Photoshop. Sorry, <laughs> one of the things you can learn on Linda is a sponsor conflict with one of our other sponsors for the show today, so I decided to skip over that. Okay. <laughs> All the courses are taught by industry experts with new courses added every week, and whether you want to set new financial goals, find work-life balance, or invest in a new hobby, ask your boss for a raise maybe, don't get any ideas, you can improve yourself and bring your job set up to job skills up to 2016 standards. Dang it, Nick. 2020. 2015 standards is what's in That's there. That's not my right. With lynda.com. You can get a 10-day free trial. All you can eat, check out lynda.com, decide if it's right for you at the link in the video description or right there, lynda.com slash wancho. And plans start at only $25 a month if you decide, yeah, Linda's awesome, which many, many of our viewers have, given that Linda's been advertising with us for like two years now yeah about that something like that yeah and uh they continue to get lots and lots of signups and we continue to not get complaints about linda which because means they're that we'll, awesome because they're awesome that disclaimer simple. using lynda.com does not guarantee that you will get a job at linus media group <laughs> yeah linus sebastian's comments and slash or statements on the WAN show are not always accurate. <laughs> That's true. We should have that disclaimer just at the bottom in the <laughs> WAN show lower Warning. <laughs> Why does Sebastian's comments? Maybe. <laughs> Warning. WAN show should be, uh, is for entertainment purposes only. 
<laughs> and should not be considered a real source of news. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of real sources of news, I think Taryn had wanted to jump onto the show. Do you want to see? Yeah, if he wants, he to, wants trade to talk in? about space and weird stuff like that. So. Oh, okay. So I'll, go, we... get, I'll go get Taryn. Um, okay. You do then. that. Uh, you do the the. Uh, the topics and stuff. Goodbye. All right. All right. Thanks, Nick. We've decided to make this more of a thing where, like, random LMG people sub in whenever Luke or I are not here. I think it's it's been pretty fun so far. I've been enjoying it. All right. So our next article here is originally from Politico.com. <clears throat> Digital campaigns. How can Democrats win with tech? That looks like a fascinating discussion that they're having right now. Ugh, I've been tagged in. Hi, everyone. Hey, how's it going? Welcome it's, to the show. It's good. So in Cleveland, Ohio, I'm going to do this one on my own while you figure out what the next yeah. topic you want to do is. In Cleveland, yeah. Ohio, Microsoft's research division advertised a technology that can read facial expressions in a massive crowd. Mm -hmm. So they can analyze emotions and report back in real time. So they're calling this real-time crowd insights. Hang on. What's the resolution of the camera they're <coughs> using? Probably uh, like NSA megapixels. Ooh. Oh. So the small camera scans the room. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. While a monitor displays the captured image. And there's actually a picture from the test here. So we'll go ahead and pop this up. Mm -hmm. Check this out. This is like scary stuff right here. 59 year old male. Whoa. 38 male happy. 37 female happy. Now, 27 male neutral. Have you ever done one of those age test thingies where it tries to guess your age based on your face and notice how it's not really that accurate? Um, Maybe there's more accurate technology out there, but well, that's a doctored image. Do you think that's a doctored image? I this think, is from a demo. This is a screen okay, grab. They probably they oh, then, then then they cherry picked the one where the ages were pretty much. Okay, well here, hold on. Okay, correct. do you think those are probably pretty much correct? I think that, she's that older girl than looks that. younger than that. Oh, oh I think well, she looks. It's kind of low that. resolution. It's hard to tell. Yeah. I think this looks about right. 59 for that guy? Yeah. 59. Yeah, gray, it's, gray it's, hair. It's hard, to a, it's hard to tell. He's got a big nose. That's not enough resolution there to be able to tell that. Did you know that your nose grows your whole life? And so do your ears? That sounds like a myth. No. Then you must be very old. <laughs> and the show's over. <laughs> yeah. And that's the end of that chapter. Um, okay, so anyway, <coughs> anyway. Okay, so I'm going to finish going through this while you find a topic that... Did you do the NASA one yet? Uh, no. So every five seconds, a new image would appear with data annotated for each face. So they assigned a serial number. This is great. Assigned a serial number, gender, estimated age, and any emotions detected in the facial expression. And they keep track of the serial number and can identify the same person hours later. No way. So a Microsoft spokesperson said, for example, that you could use this tech at a Trump rally or even the Super Bowl to find out how the audience... What on earth are you doing? I'm too short at all for this as it is right now. Now, yeah. Oh, now it's okay. good. Um, so anyway, okay, so, so let's talk about how I expect this technology to be used. Mm -hmm. Basically, we are giving politicians a tool to lie to us more effectively really yes wait who, who's this technology for for them well the way it's being pitched is that it could be used at a campaign rally uh -huh. so yeah. that way through you could actually look like imagine this this is this is like some next level stuff right here you could look you could scrub through the campaign speech and you could see a hot spot or you could see like like a, a heat map of viewer sentiment during the speech mm. every time so every time the politician says anything you can pander to viewers in real time yes just like that onion skit which is a really funny video that you should watch instead of the win show no i'm just kidding no, 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 no let's keep uh yeah pander to viewers in real in real I time i mean can you imagine if the WAN show if if i had real life mm. oh, sentiment yeah. monitoring mm. like say for example twitch chat when they're like taryn i love you you just ate that sweet so damn fabulously. I mean, just... So there you go. Yeah. In real time. Yeah, because we can watch this, but it's like really annoying to do so. 
Yeah. And so, not as trustworthy. So if we just had like, so it, yeah. it's basically taking Happy, people. sad, angry, mad. And turning them into a, a, a sentiment yeah. value. That's cool. So you could have a sentiment percentage in the crowd. So the second that, you know, let's say uh, Mrs. Trump, you know, pulls part of a speech from Michelle Obama, or the second that mm. Hillary dodges a question oh, about, wow. you know, the fact that she's being investigated in the middle of a presidential campaign, you know, I'm not taking, I'm not, yeah. quite frankly, I'm not taking sides at all in this one. Now that I know who the two candidates are, I'm just kind of, yay, I'm Canadian. This is not my problem at all. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. Can you uh, even vote? Yeah. I'm still an American citizen. Yeah, but can you vote if you're not living in America? I think you vote based on the last state you lived in, which for me is Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, there you go. So enjoy that. Oh, boy. Um, but, like, you could be saying something like, well, the most important thing to us is jobs. Yeah. And, and then you could see, like, a dip, and you could go, oh. But what that's is... not as important as yeah, yeah, the yeah. environment. Yeah. Well, it, it's wow. something comedians are good at this where they'll start a series of jokes, and if the audience reaction is really positive, they'll continue with that series. But if not, they go on to the next joke. But now we can have it for politics and have robots figuring it out. And then you create a robot that's good enough at pandering, and we won't even need politicians anymore. That's also another onion skit. We'll just put the robot in charge. Perfect. Brilliant. And President Executron. So there you go. That's kind of that's kind of my take on this. There's that picture, by the way. You guys can you guys can check that out. Um, wow, I just it's a brave new world, Linus. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything else to say other than well, uh, the, but the thing is, like we've we've heard of all of these like interesting pieces of tech that sound scary, but then we never really hear anything else. Yeah, that's because it's all happening behind closed doors. <sighs> I, I've heard that, like, the security cameras at, I forget what it was, maybe Sears or Target or something, like, they're extremely good. Have I told I you this on the show before? I think it's Target. Like, extremely good, where, to the point where they know what you've purchased yeah. before you go to the checkout. Yeah, they've actually already, I think it's Target, where yeah. they've already rung you up before yeah. you actually walk because through the Because the cameras tent. are so high resolution, yeah. they track everything, it's amazing. And, like, that's just the stuff we know about. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure Professor Zuckerberg over yeah. there has plenty going on that we yeah. don't know about. And then, like, there were NSA satellites that were decrepit, and they're like, oh, these are obsolete now. Here, NASA, you can have these. And NASA's like, holy crap, these are amazing satellites. What have you guys <laughs> been using them for? And then NASA's basically like, okay, turn them around to point at the stars instead of all of the people everywhere, because that's... Frankly, a better use for satellites. Hey, for people like me, as, far as I'm concerned, they're one and the same. You're not a star. Maybe a, maybe a very dim one. All right, so let's talk about NASA's training program that involves consumer-grade VR and quote unquote NVIDIA GPU technology. I'm now, see, this, this is, is like the, the perfect Linus and Terran topic. All right, so let's pull I'm up the uh, let's pull up the NVIDIA blog here. NVIDIA so. reported this? Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, NVIDIA is always bragging about oh, anything oh, that you yeah. can use a GPU oh, oh, for. Oh, sure. Th they're especially fond of bragging about things that you can use a GPU for that are not gaming. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So let's uh, run through the notes here once I get that switch back. <laughs> so they're embarking on a 15-year journey to Mars, and VR is going to play a key role. So they're actually going to be using NVIDIA GPU technology combined with Unreal Engine 4, Mm -hmm. Consumer grade VR, physical mockups and models, wearable technologies, and room scale tracking. And they're mm -hmm. going to create what they're calling a hybrid reality system. Very, very cool. They want to create an extremely immersive and realistic training facility mm -hmm. at a lower cost than traditional analog test fields. Hang on, this says a 15 year journey to Mars. It only takes like nine months to a year to get to Mars. Preparation? Yeah, training for sure but it's worded oddly in this document. Okay, fine, let's continue. So uh, Frank Delgado and Matthew Noyes at NASA's Johnson Space Center Hybrid Reality Lab have the goal to create this low-cost scalable platform to enable an out-of-the-world experience. So it's about incorporating the best elements of physical and virtual realities to get the best of both worlds. And there are already, I mean, it's a good thing they've given themselves 15 years for this, because <laughs> there are already ways 
to incorporate physical objects into a VR space. Uh, one of the ways I've seen it done is with tracking dots. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you put these, uh, um, that was actually a demo that I saw at the Samsung Developer Conference, where you basically put these, like, wire things with reflective, IR reflective dots mm -hmm, on them, mm -hmm. so that the VR, uh, so, like, the room scale VR cameras that are tracking you... Interesting. ...can also track these objects yeah. and know what they're supposed to be. So the mm. puzzle I solved was, like, an Indiana Jones-style... You've done this? Mo yeah. Oh. Um, move the, like, move the stone idol onto the correct thing. And it was a real stone idol and also in the game. Yes. That's very cool. Like it felt like what yeah. I was looking at in VR. But why do they need virtual reality for this? Um, I mean, I mean, they can't simulate uh, zero gravity, obviously, unless you go on the Vomit Comet and then it's only like 90 seconds. What are they simulating exactly? So what they're simulating is, well, they're, they're making it more immersive because you could mm -hmm. make the argument. Okay. But do you need that? Um, yeah, I think so. Well, what I just I don't know what they're doing with it. So it's more versatile, for one thing. Uh -huh. So if you were to create a physical training set... Oh, like a holodeck. Oh, now I understand. Yeah. So now you can do, you know... Yeah, a holodeck. Yeah, there. <laughs> well, the explanation... Well, if anybody hasn't watched Star Trek, then why are you watching the WAN show? You're not enough of a nerd. And as long as they have props that are a reasonable facsimile of whatever it is they're trying to yeah. do a training session on... Yeah then they can actually yeah, change the functionality of the room very that easily is, and very that quickly. That is interesting. There's, there is a lot of potential here, for sure. <clears throat> so very cool. they said that they're going to... Uh, okay, so they said that the Johnson Space Center's Active Response Gravity Offload System, Argos, is um, an excellent candidate to combine this VR system with a way of creating a sense of weightlessness, mm. which would be much easier when a user is in a virtual environment than is, when they're in a room. Is that when they're swimming around in the water? Um, and actually, that's what NASA does to simulate a weightless No, I think this is a different one. So here we go. This is a picture of Argos right here. A small robotic crane. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always wanted to, to like jump around with a small robotic crane getting rid of most of my body weight. So this weightless. in VR. Be very cool. That'd be so, so, so awesome. I would, I wish, can we rig one of these up? We, we have, we have beams up there. I mean, I know NASA's budget has been cut. <laughs> it's still a lot more than ours. We can, to be uh, very clear. we could get a grant from NASA and let the astronauts come here to uh, Surrey, BC. Surrey, BC. <laughs> but, quite a, quite a ways from Houston. Let's see, John, uh, John told me he was going to mark some of the topics that, uh, that he wanted to jump in on, but it looks like he actually did not, well, did not do that. Well. Okay, I have, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to, that about, you wanted to talk about? About NASA, or just about other, pro uh, about, I'll, I'll look for one, shall I? But sure. that, that NASA thing is very cool. I'd love to, like, see, like, training videos of that, to see what they do with it, you know? Be very cool. I'm stoked on that kind of stuff. All right, so dun dun dun. OnePlus is back in the news. Oh, so the invite system is gone, but uh, lo and behold, the original article here is from PhoneArena.com. The phone sold so well without the invite system that they actually have to halt sales of the OnePlus 3 for more than a month in 24 huh. countries. Hmm. So in order to build inventory back up, sales will be halted starting August 9th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time until September 12th for Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, France, Greece, Hong Kong, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, Netherlands, Portugal, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Spain. Ooh, that's fascinating. So if you place an order before the sales halt, your phone will go out on the estimated shipping date, mm. but... Uh, in the meantime, they're just like, yeah, sorry, we straight up do not have enough But we phones. have one, don't we? A one plus three? Yep. Yeah, they sent us a review Yay. sample. Um, what you got? Oh, oh, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, you ought to... <laughs> I was listening to you talk. I, I can't... It's hard to listen to someone talk and read at the same time. Well... Which is why when you're editing a video, you put as little text on the screen as possible. Fun fact. All right, our next story here is from DSL Reports. Comcast says it wants to charge Bron... 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 I don't even know what that accent was. Broadband users more for privacy. 
So Comcast this week informed the FCC that it should be able to charge broadband users looking to protect their privacy more. Wow. So the FCC has been oh, yeah. crafting new privacy rules for broadband that would force ISPs to disclose exactly Ooh. what they're collecting and selling. It's almost like the FCC is on the consumer's side for a change. Oh, wow. Imagine that. Um, and they're, they're also sides. working to provide opt-out tools for customers. Hmm. Can't you just use a VPN and just get around all this nonsense? Um, It'll be a bit slower. Yes and no. More I'm, ping. I'm not sure that it's a perfect solution, but yes, it would get around a lot. But then you're basically paying for internet and then also extra internet on top of your internet. So basically you are paying more for yeah. additional privacy. Right, but I wouldn't trust Comcast at all ever. So they're going to say, oh, you have more privacy now because you pay more. Oh, it'll be fine. Like every time you see Com Comcast's name in the news, it's something that they've done to screw over their customers, right? So basically in the news today is them saying a... it's well within our rights to screw over our customers. Oh, yeah. So what they're saying, they're arguing right. that charging consumers more money to opt out of snoopvertising, hmm. so collecting user data and selling it to advertisers, should be considered a perfectly acceptable business practice. What oh, I want to know oh, sure. is where it came from in the first place. Like, like when did I ever, aside from... Uh, you know, at the bottom of your statement, oh, by the way, our terms of service have been updated. Yeah. When did I ever say it was okay in the first place? When did this ever become the status quo? No, but that's that you just explained it. Your ter Their terms of service are sitting somewhere, and you're just supposed to read them every time they've been updated, and, uh, and then be mad and then do nothing because Comcast is the only provider in your area because they pushed out all the little guys. So this is great. And then hope for Google Fiber. They go on to say... Thanks, Comcast. A bargained for exchange of information for service is a perfectly acceptable and widely used model throughout the U.S. economy, including the internet ecosystem. Here's what I want to know. When did the bargaining take place? And, and, where was the part where I got offered a discount? Mm. Oh, that's what they're calling it now. No, no, no. No, that's oh, not what they're calling oh, it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Where was the it part be, yeah. where I got offered a discount in the first for place when they started augmenting their revenue stream that is the bill that I pay, which I don't because I don't use Comcast well, they're internet. But... It. So it would cost more without this. Exactly. <laughs> which it wouldn't, by the way. Yeah. It's like, uh, it, I, I think about big picture things like this sometimes where it's like, a company can exist, it, it seems, it, it feels like, because this is only the ones that you hear of, in, in two different, like, diametrically opposed states. Either completely screwing over their customers for as much money as they can possibly get, and forcing their way into, you know, politics and whatever, or being really nice to their customers, and customers really like them, and that's why they make a lot of money. It seems like it's only ever one or the other. Again, probably because that's the only ones you hear of. But it's like, how does a company like... Comcast continue to exist when all you ever hear about them is just pissed off people. Is it because they have their fingers in all the politics where you yeah, have they to own use them? everything? Like that's it, ah, uh, it's like the human race makes progress ten steps forward, nine steps back. We're getting there, Eventually. but it's so frustrating to see the obvious answers to things just be ignored. And it's like you know what? Don't screw over your customers, and they'll, it'll be fine. They'll be fine. Everything will work out in the end, long term. Comcast isn't even the first one to do this. Uh, AT&T actually launched uh, as a $30 or more premium if you wanted to uh, opt out of their internet preferences, which is a deep packet inspection program that tracks your browsing behavior around the internet. So that was uh, back in uh, Austin in late 2014 when they launched their gigabit internet service. Dun, dun, dun. Um. <clears throat> oh, I had picked something. Let me see here. Uh, the next Google Maps update could show how bad parking is. Yeah, that would be actually very, very useful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the original article here, that which is from useful. Daily Mail, while you go through this. Fun fact from my father, who is a city planner. Every car that you add to like the general, like a city requires seven parking spaces. Seven. You're going to have to justify that. I know we've had, we've had this conversation. Distributed but, but across, ahead, ahead. across the city, because you have to park at home, you have to park at the supermarket, you have to park at the movie theater, you have to park at the bar, 
it's like seven on average, like kind of moving around a little you bit. You should be parking at the bar. <laughs> I don't. But I, carry on. Yes. Anyway. Okay, uh, leisure center. It, 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 that's, just, that's just a fun fact. I actually haven't looked much into it. I just believe my father when he says these things. But I'll get more info on that if it's disputed. Anyway. Let's see if Taryn learns not to listen to his dad before <laughs> he turns next, 30. Yeah. <laughs> so I plan to lie to my kids about all kinds of hilarious let, stuff. You're a... Oh. Okay, pull up the thing so people can look at it. Okay. Next Google Maps update could show how bad parking is. It's per currently in beta. Could include text-based alerts informing users to parking shortages at their destination. Oh, that's great. Because it already tells you if the store is going to be closed by the time you get there. Yep, it's not always accurate, but mm. sure. We'll allow for you to... <laughs> Just these little comments, man. We'll allow for you to account for both traffic and parking scarcity at your destination. Service will likely be based on total number of spaces available in a given area, taking into account time of day and nearby public events. Oh, yeah, because I went to the laundromat one day, and it's like, where's all the parking? Oh, my goodness, I can't get through. Um, update also includes a feature that will fix when you accidentally reorient the direction of the map. What? Whatever. Keeping it always in point... Keeping it in always point north mode. Eh, whatever. More details to come. I like that, because I freaking hate that. Yeah? Yeah, when I pinch to zoom in or out, and oh. it's like, Whoa. no, that's not how I want to oh, look at oh, it. Oh, that's not just for the parking, that's for the whole map. Yeah. Okay, well then that's great. I was like, why is it just for parking? So yeah, that's I'm good. really interested to see how this impacts businesses. Mm. Because in the, in the analog age, mm. people would just have to, like, remember. Oh, there's not much parking on Robson during yeah. the evenings. And on Sunday, Costco in the evening is nuts. Right. You would just have to remember stuff like that. But you know what? Now, if you drive a bike, you never, ever have these problems. No one on earth drives a bike. Ride a bike. Um, but now, ever. what you'll be able to do as a consumer, so, so like the digital consumer, the millennial consumer, is going to all of a sudden start shifting business away. Like just Google making this one update. The millennial consumer is going to start going somewhere else in the first place. Mm, yeah. For the sake of finding easier yeah. parking. I see it happening. Well, you know what I do whenever I drive anywhere, which isn't often because I bike and whatever, yeah. whatever, but I will always do Google map instructions to my destination because it routes you around traffic blockages. In theory. Well, I've had very good luck with it for the most part. I've had some experiences not that long ago sitting in traffic mm -hmm. with a red line yeah. completely between well, me and my destination. Yeah. Um, do you remember that day you guys... it doesn't guys, tell you to get off. Do you remember the day you guys did the Hot Dog Channel Superfund? Hot Dog Olympics? No, I, did, wasn't, I didn't participate in Oh, that. okay. Well, I was trying to get back to the office, and there was a massive accident. Oh, yeah. And so I fired up Google Maps as I realized it was slowing down. And it didn't. I saw a red line all the way, yeah. so it knew it was taking a long time. But my update... Like, or I'm sorry, my estimated time of arrival... Was the same. ...only ticked one minute for oh. every minute that passed. Like, it didn't update to say that it was going to take longer uh, You know what? At all. The system is in, in progress. At they're, all. They're working on it. What all can right. I say? It works better to have it open than to not have it. So I'll always check. I'll always check with it. I've avoided lots of congestion that way. Jazz hands. Um, I do have an update. This is really important um, Jazz hands. because we talked about this on a previous WAN show and the facts of the matter are a little bit more complicated than they originally made out to be by some uh, Western media publications. Using VPNs, what UAE residents need to know. <laughs> so it's not always illegal, to be very clear. That is not what happened. Sorry about that. Um, the legality actually hasn't changed, and not all residents in the UAE who use the technology could face imprisonment and fines. So the confusion surrounding the impact of the law stemmed from inaccurate reporting by foreign news websites, according to a UAE-based lawyer. So what has been amended in the cybercrime law is the amount of fines that offenders will face in addition to the existing provision on imprisonment. So a senior associate at Clyde & Co. suggested, so as a lawyer, suggested that private individuals, aside from corporate organizations, don't run the risk of going to jail and paying a fine as long as they don't use a VPN to commit a crime. Oh. That's all well, there is to it. How would you know? Misuse of the technology may still be punishable. Well, basically what they're saying, 
It, basically, what they're doing is they're taking something that's very difficult to track yeah. and putting a horrendous punishment on it oh, good so they can make an example out of whoever gets caught. Because well, it's fines up to like half a million US dollars and imprisonment Lord. for like years. So you just have to find a VPN that does not keep logs. Or at least says that they does not keep logs. Yeah. So and who really knows with all the gag orders going around? Would you? Would you? Look at how knowledgeable I am about something, sort of. Would you bet half a million dollars? Oh on man, any of that? that's what they're. That's what they're. Half going a million for. dollar fine. That's what they want you to consider yep. when you're like, I just want to, you know, pirate some movies, or I could, you know, be in the slammer and. I mean, there's been a lot of half a million dollars. There's been a lot of uh, debate about. Uh, sort of creating very, very harsh punishments yeah. for crimes. Yeah. Um, and whether that makes more sense than correctional facilities, yeah. especially around the death penalty. And, and also just like a general little bit of a punishment for everyone rather than a huge punishment for some people. Yeah. But so, the issue is catching them. I guess. So, so there's been a lot of debate as to whether a whether stiffer penalties actually serve as a deterrent yeah. or whether the people committing crimes are just criminals and always assuming they won't get caught regardless of what the penalty is there a way to happens to be or that? not be well it's been it's been sort of demonstrated either way and it's an oh, ongoing yeah, debate because right. it especially centers around the death penalty right yeah cuz yeah cuz there's no hope for rehabilitation with the death penalty yeah like that's it so and basically they're saying that there's you know oh well you should just make it the death penalty for everything because then no one will commit crimes yeah because that'll work they'll die yeah but, there's a Star Trek episode about that. exactly so this has been a debate for decades literally decades um, so I'm not sure if it'll end up working out for them in this case but I guess we shall find out oh, this gives me some hope for humanity Facebook has tweaked their algorithm to show you less, less clickbait, clickbait. Woo! So the original article here is from the BBC, Facebook to suppress clickbait stories. And Facebook, let me tell you, when they want to suppress something, uh, man. Do they know how to do that? They suppress something. So they created new guidelines around sponsored posts that make it so that we have to put hashtag ad and we have to, which was already the case. Yeah, we already did that. But we also have to tag on Facebook the company that sponsored it. We have to tag their Facebook page. Okay. And this is so that Facebook can basically turn around and offer that company a chance to promote that post. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And what they do is they bury those posts. Like just oh, crush them. Oh, because you put ad on them and because you put, yeah, yeah. So they're no, making yeah, it. Yeah, oh yeah. So their terms of service is that we have to identify it. We have to identify who paid for it yeah. to them in a way that they can act on. Mm -hmm. And then they will just crush the reach of it. There is a whole, uh, there's two videos by Derek of Veritasium that you can watch about. It's called Facebook Fraud, where he talks about promoting a, a page promoting a fake page and promoting his real page and how the more you pay in, the more you need to pay in. Uh, there's just a huge number of problems with this whole like Facebook incentivizing you having to pay them money yep. to get any kind of visibility. It reminds me a lot of microtransactions yep. in games like Pokemon Go, for example, where once you start paying to play, you pretty much are stuck paying forever and it's yep. just like more money. And every single thing that you do pushes you more towards giving them money. So and it's like, that's not fun for anybody. We paid for Facebook reach once. Did we? Yep. Why I'd, did we do that? I decided to try it. What well, happened? Um, we got a few more views on the post and then it prompted me to pay more to get more views. Oh, what a surprise. I just said that. Um, and honestly, compared to creating, I mean, this is something that I think for for soulless, imaginationless companies mm -hmm. might make sense to pay for reach. But yeah. for content creators, where our entire, our entire business is making content that people actually care about, mm -hmm. for content creators, it is much, much cheaper uh, and more effective to mouth. just make good content. Yes, uh, the SEO thing for this is content is king. But it doesn't help us when they intentionally crush certain posts. Oh, yeah. Well, of course they will. I mean, they're just... It's just, I mean, I stopped doing Facebook stuff like ages ago. Like, they're not cool. I'm surprised anymore. you ever Zuckerberg. were on Facebook. Zuckerberg. Facebook used to be cool. In the chat, tell us about when Facebook was cool. It used to be cool. Hold on, we're going to straw now pull this. It's just this nonsense. We're going to straw pull thing. this. Hold on, we're going to straw pull this. Straw like, and, pull and this. they slow. I don't remember what update it was. I think it was like the timeline update 
where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm sick of this now. I'm not going to keep on going. It was a great way to keep in contact with your high school buddies. Like, if you watch the movie, um, what is it called? Social Network, or maybe The Social Network. Boom. All right, guys, uh, check it out, check it out. Facebook used to be cool. Okay, and Twitch Facebook chat. very cool in that movie. Twitch very chat cool. says, uh, 1990, uh, ICQ was cool. MySpace was cool. It was cool. It was also stupid, but it was also cool. Um, 2006, 2009, year 1800. This is why we never consult Twitch chat about anything, by the way. Well, This okay. is what you're learning the hard way. <laughs> well, what do they know? Today. What, what do you know? What do I know? I know not to ask Twitch chat anything. No, I was looking at the camera problem. and asking that. All right, 55% of people are saying Facebook was cool. Ah. With 45% on my team. Oh, well. You didn't add turnip in there, so I think all the trolls are on your team. The trolls are not on my team. Yeah, they, they the like The trolls you are never trolls. on my team. Oh, yeah? They do not like me. <laughs> well, okay. The trolls love to hate on me. <laughs> it was cool. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you very much. Do you want to throw uh, John in here? Because there were a couple of Where things that John? I wanted to... Over... Presumably I'll, at I'll his go, desk. I'll I'm go. Just... I'm bringing my m and with me. Though. I'm going to jump right into our next topic here. Euro oh, thank you. Look, it's like it's like a little M&M Santa. The M&Ms are a little salty. I can't tell if that's like sweat or not. Anyway. Original article here is from Eurogamer.net. Hi, Linus. Hey, how's it going? Hey, everyone. We have so many hosts today. I actually like this. Which one am I, number three? You're number three, yeah. The Xbox One S has a performance boost, and it has been revealed, and it has apparently been benchmarked by Eurogamer.net. Have you looked into this one at all? No, I haven't. I think all the most of the topics I wanted to do, you do with Taryn, so... You didn't mark them. I said I put them near the top. Uh, oh, I... Yeah, I... I didn't know if near the top meant at the top, or at like... At the top. Next time, put John. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. It's fine. That's fine. We can talk about the Xbox One S. Let's do it. So it was released August 2nd, has a GPU clock speed of 914 megahertz. Wow. How many? Wow, Vancouver. 914 megahertz. Okay. That's up from 853 on the older version. It supports 4K as well as HDR, media and gaming. It's amazing what you can do with, uh, what is that, 61 megahertz these days? <laughs> Who made the GPU, do we know? Uh, it's still, uh, still AMD. Okay. Uh, 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray and 4K video streaming are supported. That's a positive. That's a plus. HDR supported for games and video. I just said that. I, okay, notes are redundant. Important note, HDMI 2.0 will not be included. So 4K is only available in up to 30 FPS. So still, even now, they're not putting HDMI 2.0. No. When is this coming out? So the thing to bear in mind is that this is based on an AMD... Oh, I forget what the architecture is, but it's GCN whatever mm -hmm. whatever revision, uh, which did not support. So it's like HDMI a generation or two old. So yeah. it's a generation... It's a gener yeah, I think it's two, two architectural generations old, but depending on how you divide up AMD's lineup, given that they have products that are literally three generations old still in their lineup. And they've been rebadged, yeah. That have been rebadged. It's really, really hard to draw <laughs> a, clear, a clear line. It upscales 1080p or other content to 4K, and Microsoft says, some games, ones that utilize dynamic resolution and or unlocked frame rates, may see a very minor performance improvement. Our testing internally has shown this to be pretty minor and is only measurable on certain games, so we didn't want to make it a selling point for the new console. So... <laughs> Yeah, upscaling hasn't been a selling point for a while on basically anything. So. C consoles. Is this... <sighs> what do you think of the Xbox One S? Yes. What's the price point? Do we know? Yeah, it's out, isn't it? I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> I have no idea what the price point is. I'm sorry. I pay, <laughs> I pay so little attention. Dbrand actually contacted me um, recently asking if I wanted an Xbox One S with their skin mm -hmm. on it for a review. And I was like, oh, when's it coming? And he's like, like, I have it. I'm like, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so are we just giving this a gigantic, uh, a gigantic shrug? And then I move on to, uh, there was one that I really wanted to talk to you about. It was the 6% Netflix tax mm -hmm. for uh, Pennsylvania. Right. Well, I mean... Uh... 
you know, people compare the console and the PC space so much, but I mean, I really feel like consoles are for a different type of consumer. They just want to plug something in and in. go for it, and they don't care. Whoa, oh, that is so much better. Why was this up here? Taryn put it there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Jeez. Okay. What are we going to do with that guy? You tell me. But he, I don't know. But uh, so, I mean, in that vein, I guess it would make, I, I think if you're in the console market, the price it might matter like a little bit less. You're saying, oh, you can get so much more performance on a PC for this amount of money. But at the same time, if you're saying, oh, I just want something I can plug in and go with and not have to worry about drivers or putting anything together and I want it to do 4K, then there you go. So basically so. the Xbox One S is just another console to you. It doesn't matter that it's smaller or like 60 megahertz faster. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Serious question? Let's move on to <laughs> this one's pretty interesting. There will be a 6% Netflix tax for citizens of Pennsylvania, USA. So do you want to want to walk us through this? The doc's here, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's Netflix, it's Hulu, it's Spotify. If you have a, um, if you have like a Spotify premium subscription. It's so basically all that stuff is going to get taxed now. Any kind of streaming media thing. So let's see. Where, what where I want to understand thing? is mm -hmm. what would be the justification for a tax on streaming media? The state might be broke like a lot of the states are. <laughs> hey, here's an easy way to make money. Let's just tax this thing that everyone else is watching instead of paying for cable. So really, that, do you think it's that simple? So do you think it's as simple as them not get... Okay, so a cable subscription is closer to $100 a month, mm -hmm. right? Do you think it's as simple as them not getting there? And I'm going to throw an arbitrary number because sure. uh, sales tax varies wildly from state to state and even within Canada. Actually, we'll real quick for you that it says right here, done to help offset a $1.3 billion hole in the state budget. Okay. There you have it, but please continue. So do you think this is as simple enough a calculation that we could just go, okay, so a cable bill used to be $100 a month, and mm -hmm. let's say they had a 10% uh, you know, sales tax, and so they get 10 bucks for your cable bill. So as people stop spending money on cable and they start buying Netflix subscriptions for $7 or $8 a month, now they have to just charge like a $7 or $8 levy to make up the difference. I mean, is that what's happening here? I don't know. I mean, you already get stuck with like however many surcharges on your cable bill. They might not call them taxes, but they're often like government fees or like something or another. So I don't know. I think... I think states recently have gotten very, very upset when there's certain things that people just buy, just like you would buy anything else with, or just how you would buy anything else, and they don't get a, a don't get a cut of the taxes for it. Like yep. cross border shopping, yes, online. Um, yeah, back in North Carolina, where I'm from, they recently started having the Amazon tax. They call it a use tax, but it's really just another sales tax. Where if you get an Amazon receipt and they didn't charge you tax on it, you're supposed to supposed to every year say oh i bought thirty dollars worth of widgets or toilet paper or whatever else from amazon and right and so you owe the state like you know a dollar or two on your tax return but almost nobody does it it's kind of a joke but they still try i mean that's the thing that's gonna make that uh, that makes law so complicated in the united states because that's what it is mm -hmm. it's a united states it's not it is okay don't take this the wrong way but it's not <laughs> as much of a country as it is I know what you're saying. a conglomerate of like city states but but like actual states because they're bigger of, than that's, cities it's that, like that's part of part of why the civil war happened even. yeah We've been exactly about it for a long time so yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like america's happy about this situation either so so i mean here in canada it got as it was as simple as the federal government said no this will not fly. This happened about four or five, five years ago. Oh, they tried to Something. tax streaming services up here. Did that happen? No, not streaming services. Um, Cross-border uh, cross <coughs> uh, online orders. Right, right. And basically what they did is they put the onus on the retailer. They said, okay, well, fine. NCIX, you're located in British Columbia. Good mm -hmm. for you. You are now responsible for collecting provincial sales tax from every province and submitting that to those provinces. Done. And it was implemented within, I think, about a year. That seems a lot simpler, but I don't know. I don't know if it's just because we have so many more people or what, but, um, but I also understand what you're saying. You know, the federal character of the U.S. and, oh, like every state yep. needs to decide how they're going to try to get their cut, so. 
Very, very interesting to me. Yeah, it's not going to come out to be a ton of money. Like if you pay for, you know, if you spend what, like 10 bucks a month on a Netflix subscription over the course of a year, that doesn't work out to be a whole lot. But right. still, you know, there's going to be people who are angry about that, you know, so. All right. Well, I actually don't have that much left. I'm so, I'm sorry I screwed up and did the topics that you wanted to help with I, earlier on the on in the show. Next time we do this, I'll I'll make it more clear. Um, is we, there anything else you wanted to jump through? Did we talk about the set top box thing from the copyright? No, office? we didn't actually. We oh. can do that one as our last topic. Sure. Uh, hold on. Let me just pull it up here. Set. Oh crap. Control F set is not the best. Uh, Offset, set top, there we go. All right, so the original article here is from Ars Technica. I'm just going to pull this up while John walks you guys through what's going on with this this baby right here. Oh, great. As soon as you said it, my like Google Doc just jumped everywhere, but let's find it again. Okay, let's... so I'll start. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so right now there's a dispute between the SEC and the U.S. Copyright Office about whether cable companies should be forced to unlock their set-top boxes. So right now, if you have a cable subscription, at least in the U.S., you get like a little box that sits either above or below your TV. You hook it up with an HDMI cable, but everything that comes into the box is copy protected in some form or another. So it's not like in the good old days where you could just have a VCR record anything you want to onto a blank tape. Um, it's, you can't just you know plug in a USB stick or a computer and say, okay, record. To be clear, there are ways around it. There are ways around it, but if you're just trying to do it without implementing any kind of you know subversion mechanism or whatever yeah. then yeah you can't do it so and it is illegal to copy uh, encrypted content but that's a whole other conversation yes it is okay mm -hmm. so basically what's so what's going on now so they're trying to wrangle over whether they're going to adopt this um, FCC rule. Um, the FCC is being a little bit more pro-consumer in this case. They want to force the cable companies to say, yo, you have to unlock your set-top boxes. So if a paying customer wants to watch whatever it is, Game of Thrones, whatever else, um, and they're not in front of their TV at the time it's being shown, but they also they want to watch it like somewhere else. They don't want to watch, DVR it. They have to let the consumer be able to do that right and the copyright office is saying no we can't because then you're just going to crap all over the copyright owner's rights and there's no way there's no way to like license this out correctly and all this other stuff um so they're trying they're trying to figure that out right now so uh, and i mean you got to remember too that the cable providers are obviously going to be putting pressure on anyone that they possibly can to salvage more ways for them to make revenue. I mean, if they could sell the ability to stream it to your phone, to yourself, while it's happening, while you're on the bus, I'm sure they'd love to do that. Don't don't some of them already do that? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, like the on-demand video and all that. Yep. But they're trying to they're trying to like increase, or the SEC rule is designed to try to increase flexibility for yep. cable customers. And I remember that. Well, I don't remember because I was either not alive or very young when this happened. But we actually studied this a little bit in law school when the uh, VCR came out, and that was like the latest and greatest thing. Uh, TV, TV studios and movie studios and cable providers were concerned that, oh, this is going to lead to incredibly rampant copyright infringement. This yep. is going to just, you know, undermine the entire system. So it ended up going to court. And we all kind of know how that turned out. People used VCRs anyway to record Urkel or whatever people watched back in the 90s. And everything was okay. The show's and, called Family Matters. Okay. <laughs> and people were still buying cable subscriptions. So this, right. is, this is kind of similar, but I think... Here, the concern might be a bit different because back in the 90s, you weren't just going to send out 2 million free copies of a TV show because you felt like it. But these days, right. it, it takes that amount of time to upload something onto the internet. Yep. So. And it's also a lot more user-friendly to record these days. Um, like mm -hmm. back then, you had, to, you had to hover over your VCR and... What's the difference between LP and EP? I don't know what this oh, is. Oh, no! <laughs> Long play versus extended play! Why are they named like this? <laughs> um... So I think that's pretty much it for the WAN Show then, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks to our special guests who joined us, John, Taryn, and Nick. Actually, I don't want to thank Taryn. Thanks to our special <laughs> guests who joined us, John and Nick. And uh, Taryn was here too. We're and Taryn. we will see you again next week. There goes the train. Same bat time, same bat channel. There goes that train again. Fantastic. Always. It is really nice. It is really nice streaming without any technical difficulties. I really like it. Yeah, I can't believe it's going to be kind of on. No, closer to on than I have to be. Like, wow, I don't say that. Closer to on. And just like.
I've got everything working now, and the stream computer isn't being flaky, so like, volume is all leveled correctly before the show starts. And That's, stuff. Good. That's good. 